Is there anyone of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with all in the name of the Lord. And the, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick well. The Lord will raise him up, and if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other, and they pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I like King James' version. It says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avereth much. Verse 17 says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way, he will save him from death and the cover over the multitude of sin. Let's pray. Our God and our Lord, you have spoken to us in diverse, diverse manners. And, O oh God, we ask you right now, have thy own way. Touch us, cover us through the blood of Jesus. Visit us, O oh God. Let there be the hand of God in Jesus' holy name. Lord, I pray that let me not speak on my own and out of my intellect, but, O oh God, I call for the Holy Ghost power to come and take over this church right now and touch each and every heart in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that your love will cover us. Every one of us, O oh God, will be covered by your grace and by your love in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seats. I wonder how many remembers last week's message that was in the bulletins. How many read real the bulletins? Do we? How many take the bulletins home and read them? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I have started gleaning into some of these things in the bulletins. I don't know how many remember this. If you plant for a year, plant grain. You remember that it was written? If you plant for 10 years, plant trees. My God, is that not awesome? I want to encourage you that these bulletins are so powerful. If you plant for 100 years, plant men. <laughs> Amen. If you plant for 100 years, plant what? But if you plant for eternity, plant the word of God. Amen. Amen. So how many here can say, I'm planting the word of God in my life? Because everything else will vanish, but the word of God will never what? Vanish. And then, in the same bulletin last week, there was this. The harvest of God is seed time and the harvest time, and it shall not cease. I think God is calling us to the harvest time. The harvest, the harvest seen produces whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also what? Reap. Then, in the same bulletin, there was the gospel harvest. The fields are white and red for the harvest. Man, we better be reading these bulletins because they can carry us for the week. Then he says, the harvest of judgment, the harvest, the end time of the age. We're talking about this gentleman in the book of James. I want to call him, I have been calling him Pastor James. But the more I have uh, been looking at James, I have found out that he is addressing our church today. He is addressing Home City Church. He is addressing me. He is addressing you. Then we begin to see 
There are a number of things that we as a board of believers we must understand. The spiritual discernment are all appropriate. Then he begins to speak about the anoint, anointing him with all in the name of the Lord. Why should we call the elders to anoint us with all? James is speaking about that today. You look over here, I don't know where my all is, but there's a lot of all. Yes, there it is at the back there. If you look in the Bible, you'll find that three quarters of the things that were happening, it was the anointing. Olive oil was the most common and it was used for purposes both secular, food, lamp, fuel, and the medicine ointment, and the religious, anointing kings, priests, prophets, tabernacles, temple uses, purifications from rituals, and offering sacrifices. Here's something that I love about gems. James doesn't give details regarding the type or the quantity of all that was used. He just speaks about, if there's anyone who is sick in your midst, let him call for the elders. In the book of Exodus, Moses, Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 to 25, Moses gave a recipe for anointing all that including mouse, cinnamon, cane, cashew, olive oil, that produced a bunch of half of the leaders for the board of Christ to be anointed. Now, why is this all important? The anointing breaks the yoke. Amen? The anointing breaks the yoke. Over the course of this brief letter that James was writing, he's discussing the key themes to help Christians mature in the faith. He's trying to teach us, how can we mature? There are a number of things that we have to look as James is teaching us. Number one, he wants us to stand firm during trials and the temptation. He is teaching us to stand firm. The second thing that James is teaching us, he's teaching us living out of the Christian faith in a practical ways rather than just studying or hearing it. You know, these days we have lots of people that is tired and they hear, but they don't live a practical life. So here James is telling us to say, we need to live a practical life. That's why he's inviting the elders to pray for those that are not feeling well. Amen. He's also helping us loving selflessly. Loving selflessly has got so many areas and remedies. When you love somebody, feel free to correct them. Feel free to rebuke them. Feel free to exhort them. Feel free to admonish them. Feel free to encourage them. Feel free to scorn them so that they can repent. Here's what happens. We all are afraid to rebuke those whom we love because we think they will be uh, upset with us. If they are upset, then they are not teachable and they have no trust in them. Amen. Secret love, you know, will always mislead us. But the faithful love will always bring us to the point whereby we can understand and receive a demolishing. The church of this generation, we don't want to be rebuked. If we are rebuked, we get upset. Here's James what he's teaching us. He's exhorting us. He's encouraging us. He is rebuking us. But also he's telling us how we should go about as the body of Christ. Now, there's other thing that James is teaching us. Taming the time. Humbling our oneself before God. Trusting in God rather than in the wealth and exercising patience. He's telling us how to exercise patience. He concludes these trials or 
of a discipling with a call to prayer with faith. He's encouraging us how we can call to pray for faith. Each circumstance of life is encouraging us to pray. That means everything that we go through, our way or our end should be prayer. Now, in each circumstance, as he's encouraging us to pray, what are we going to find? There will be trouble. There will be happiness. There will be sickness. And all are an occasion where prayer and the worship is required. When we are going through difficult moments, what are we supposed to do? Pray and the worship. When we are going wonderful time, what are we supposed to do? Pray and the worship. There were singers some years ago, they were called the Makemis. I don't know who have heard of the Makemis, if you love country music. They used to sing a song, God on the mountain is the same God on the valley. And the God on the valley is the same God on the mountain. How many of us would love to praise God when you're in the mountain? But do you remember that when you're on the mountain, it's the same God as the God in the valley? So what James is telling us, don't only praise God when you're on the mountain, praise God when you're on the valley. How many times can we get to a moment where we say, God, I'm going through the valley. I don't know my way out, but I'm here to praise you. God, I'm going through difficult moments. I'm here to praise you. I don't understand what's happening, but you have called me to do what? To praise him. How does one pray then? When it comes to difficult time to pray for oneself, nobody wants to pray for oneself. If I'm going through something, I want someone to pray for me. Not because I can't pray for myself. Sometimes we feel comfortable for someone to pray for us. But I strongly believe that it's important in life to reach out and say, God, you know, help me right now. If you cannot mumble the words, just simply say hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. You are worthy. I worship you. I honor you. There's nothing else. Sometimes we run out of words. That's why the Bible encourages us to pray in the Spirit. Because when you pray in the Spirit, you pray the language not known to men, but the language known to God. Now, you may say, well, preacher, but I'm not blessed to speak in the unknown language. What am I supposed to just simply say, tell him how much you love him. God loves to be adored. Amen? God loves to be adored. And in each circumstance of life, we must remember that prayer is the key factor. If faith, we must have faith to ask for prayer. We must have faith to ask prayers from others. Many times I've called others to say, brother, sister, can you pray for me? God requires us sometimes to reach out to others and just pray for them. And just simply say, I'm standing on your God, brother. I'm standing on your God, sister. And when you say you are praying, don't only mention that you're praying for somebody. Start praying for them real serious because one of the things that I've found these days, a lot of people, they'll say, I'm praying for you, brother. And it, you never even pray for them. I'm praying for you, sister. You never really pray for them. When you pray, pray for them earnestly. This is what I've started doing myself. When a person says, Pastor, I'm needing for prayers. I don't even waste the time because I don't know what my next two, three minutes will be. I'll say, let's pray right now. Amen. Let's do what? Let's pray right now. you find whenever I have done that, on my own time, I'll have the room to remember that I covenanted with somebody. The way the covenant is an agreement. I agreed to pray for somebody. And that God needs to touch this person. James here, he's encouraging. Is any one of you in trouble? Now you may say, I don't have trouble. Believe me, there are many times when we go through difficult moments, we do not know. And here's what he's saying. He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of what? 
praise. So God is calling us, if you are happy right now, begin to sing songs of praise. I like Dr. Miles Monroe. He says, the only thing that the devil is jealous of you is to see you happy. It's to see you when you get in the house of God, praising God. It's to see you when you, he says, that you make the devil jealous. And Miles Monroe used to say, the late Miles Monroe, I used to love him. I don't know how many used to follow Miles Monroe. But he was one of the greatest leaders in this generation. God took him, you know, so soon. And those are the people that you say, so soon, you're gone so soon. But Miles Monroe used to say these things. He says, when you praise God, you make the devil jealous. How many would love to make the devil jealous? Amen. It seems in this church, only there's a, there are only a few people. I'm not going to force you <laughs> to raise your hand. But I want to make the devil jealous. Because if I don't make the devil jealous, he's got a certain way how to hold me and they put me in bondage. How many would love to make the devil jealous? Make the devil jealous and then let him run away from you. Amen. Then he goes on. Is anyone of you sick? He should call for the elders of the what? Church. Church to do what? To pray. And how do they pray? Over him and anoint him or her with all in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Anoint him or her with the all. James instructs the sick here. The sick person to call for the elders of the church. It's important to belong to a board of believers. Here's what is happening these days. Most of the people, they have uh, no loyalty to the authority that God has given over you. If you have no loyalty to the authority that God has given you, the people that you can see, how can you have loyalty to God whom you cannot see? Amen? That's definitely no, no. When a person says, well, me, I want to honor God. I want to love God. My loyalty is to God. That means God, he says, how can you love me whom you have not seen? If you fail to love the people that you see, there's no way how you can pretend to love God. So what God is teaching us is first, we should show love one to another. Amen? We should appreciate one another. We should show, you know, total love, believing that I, truly, I truly love you. And I believe in what you do. I believe in who you are. And when we do that, it will be easy to love God. Amen? And as we love God, God knows where the true love resides. Amen? I think it is significant that James doesn't put the burden of prayer on the sick person. His responsibility is to call for others to pray, not just to pray alone. This is what James is saying. I'm giving you the responsibility, but call others to pray for you. For the fervent prayers of a righteous man are very much. So he's telling us that as these believers, they begin to pray. You know, there's something that is going to happen. Here's what happens. When the body of Christ begin to pray, there are a lot of things that are going to surface up. The reason why sometimes some of the things that do not surface up, there's nothing that disturbs those prayers, but th th those things. But when we get down on our knees, begin to pray, begin to believe God, bring, begin to break the powers of the enemy, you know what is going to happen? you will find that devils begin to come up because there is no peace. You begin to see the manifestation of the enemy because why? Prayers disturbs the wake of the enemy. Where there is no prayer, the enemy is comfortable. The enemy says, I live here. I reside here. This is my place. You cannot evict me. That's why you find sometimes people, they are going through a lot of things and they go to some places where they said, I just need some deliverance. It's because there's no prayer in their lives. If there is prayer, prayer is like exercising our bodies every day. Like you wake up every morning, you want to stay fit. 
And that's the way how prayer is. You wake up in the morning, you go to the gym, you run around, you do everything. You walk everywhere. You burn in your calories. That's what the prayer is. The more you pray, the more God responds. The more you begin to see what the enemy is trying to do. And the more you begin to rebuke the enemy and destroy the powers of the enemy. And they begin to say, whom the Son of God set free is free indeed. And they begin to enjoy your freedom. Of course, the sick person who asks God to help him, that's taken for granted. We are always to pray about everything. Pray for everything in prayer and what? Supplication. Just ask God. But when illness becomes serious, the sick person does not need to rely upon his own faith. He is to call for others. And what I'm trying to teach you here is what they call ecclesia, the church. What is supposed to be done in the church? When you are part of the body of believers, you're going through something, don't bear it alone. Call for those that are elders of the church. The elders of the church I explained last week. That means those pastors, you know, those who are leaders, those who are in the leadership. Let them come and lay hands. Let them come and anoint you. Let them come and rebuke the enemy. Here's what happens. As they rebuke the devil, the devil begins to free. Invite them to pray in your homes. There are homes that are haunted and a number of us, we don't even realize I'm living in a home that is haunted. Every night when you go to sleep, you are attacked by wicked, evil dreams. And you say, why am I attacked with these things? Nobody came to consecrate your home. Nobody came to pray for your home. Your home is a den of the enemy. But you as a child of God, you need to call for some people to come and pray for you. When we came over here, when we took over this church here, this building, the first thing that we did, we were praying every day. We left music praying throughout the night. And I remember when they were still building this place, there's a young man, I think it's Julie's grandson. He came over here and he was taking a video. He saw some objects when there was nothing here during daylight that was going through. Why? We don't know what was here, but I can tell you what was here, what was there then is not here today. Why? Because we have sanctified this place with prayer. Pray without a season. Somebody say with me. Pray without a season. Amen. How many believe in prayer? Amen. Prayer changes things. You know, prayer brings us to the level where we understand who God is. You know, when you look in the Bible, you know, you find different times when Jesus was invited to pray for a lot of issues that we are going on. Jairus comes asking Jesus to heal his daughter, but when messengers come from home to report her death, Jesus can see Jairus foretelling. Jesus knows what we are going through before we even say anything. The Bible says, before you prayed, I answered you. But I hate you. So that means you and I, before we even said, dear God, before we kneeled down, he already knew. Jesus saw Jaws foretelling, Jaws wavering, Jaws coming to the point where he said, throwing his hand, I don't know what to do. I've come to an end. This is the end of my journey. My daughter is about to die. My daughter is dead. What can I do? But Jesus said in his word, don't be afraid, just believe. What does Jesus do? He reassures him and your daughter is healed. Amen. So when we depend on Jesus' uh, assurance, things, they happen. To the epileptic boy, the one who was suffering, what do you call it, epileptic, or is, am I right? Boy, father who asked if Jesus could do anything, Jesus replied, if everything is possible to him, that what? Believes. So what God is saying here, do you believe? That's the question. Do you believe that when you call upon the name of God, God will answer? When we pray, do we believe that he's faithful to respond? 
When we ask God, do, are we waiting for the results? Are we waiting for the response? Are we believing that God is going to do something? You know, what does this man say? I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Isn't that well, what we say? I do believe, but help me to overcome my what? Now, I don't want to ask this question, but I believe probably as we are in this building today, probably I would say, you know, maybe two out of ten, I mean, let me say nine out of ten, we have unbelief. We don't believe that God can do anything. Let me tell you something. Denial, be, delay is not denial. Just because God is delaying responding, it doesn't mean he has denied you. Amen? So God, what he's doing at this moment, he's trying to show you, he, the delay is because God is trying to teach us patience. Amen? He's trying to teach you to depend. This man, he says, help me to overcome my what? My unbelief. But it wasn't only the father's faith involved in healing. Why had the disciples failed to cast out the demon causing the illness? Jesus explained it. Because you have little faith. You have what? Little faith. You men of little faith. When we have little faith, we want to believe God for a miracle. And this is what amazes me these days. If we cannot believe God to heal a headache, we want to believe God to raise the dead. It's madness, is it? We can't believe God for small things, but we want to believe God for mountain. I think God, what he's saying, if you're going to believe me for mountain, believe me for small things. <laughs> you know, I used to have a pastor who used to say, you know, when we used to live in Tennessee, he used to say, you know, it says, let your shoes meet the, what, the road. Let your rubbers meet the earth so that you can see the proof. So what do we say? It must come you know, to be real, I'm believing God for a breakthrough. I'm believing God for a miracle. I am the recipient. I am the connection. I am the answer that God has positioned here. I am the key that sees things beyond another human being that way how they see them. I know that as long as I'm here, something will happen. I'm believing for a breakthrough, and then nothing would change my breakthrough. I'm believing when I pray for somebody, somebody may receive a miracle. I'm believing that when I lay hands on someone, whatever the problem is, the person must receive the deliverance. Whatever it is, I'm believing. I have no fear. I have the faith. Faith, fear, is the opposite of faith. Fear, you are saying, I don't believe that God can do it. Faith says, I know it's impossible, but my God is able. Fear says, you are too late. Faith says, now is the time. Amen? Fear says, look, everything is against you. Faith says, everything is for you. So faith opposes fear. Here's the problem. Every one of us is surrounded by what? Fear. But God is saying, be surrounded by what? Faith. Amen. So most of the times, we are hooked, surrounded by fear. The devil is just showing us nothing. The first thing that comes into your mind, what if this doesn't happen? The whole world will laugh at me. Don't worry about the world. The whole world can laugh at you if Jesus is cheering on you. You are in good position. Amen? Don't worry about it the way how the world is laughing at you. Believe on what God is saying. You know, there's some things that we see here God is trying to teach the elders of the church. 
Is there anyone sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The all, the anointing, the anointing of Jesus breaks the yoke. What is the yoke? The yoke is something that is put on your neck to bow you, to bring pressure so that you can do the task of the one who have put the yoke on you. You know, if you look in the olden days, this is what they used to do. They would put the two oxen or four oxen or twelve oxen and they put the yoke and then the man is having a prow at the back and they begin to till the land. These days, people, they have tractors. But in those days, they could put the yoke on the oxen. And that oxen will be tilting the land until the master said, it's enough, now we can go home. And tomorrow morning, they can come again and they finish the portion. I got a bad news for you. The devil, that's what he has done. He has put the yoke on us. He has put the yoke on the people. You wake up in the morning, you are a slave for the devil, you are laboring for the devil, and after the devil is finished to do that, he removes the yoke. He says, I'll require of you the following day. That's what we call bondage. When we say this person or this man or this woman, he is in the bondage, it's because the devil has put the yoke on you. Now, here's the good news. God realized that this yoke can only be removed not by beating the person who is in trouble, but the yoke can only be removed by the anointing. The anointing of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The anointing of the Messiah breaks that yoke, removes you from the bondage. That's why when you say in the name of Jesus, the demons must tremble. The demons must run away. Why? Because the devil has no power over you. So I want to let you know today that in the name of Jesus, why James was saying, if there is anyone that is sick, let him call for the elders. What are the elders going to do? They are going to break the yoke. They are going to anoint the person. And that anointing will cause the yoke to be slippery. Hallelujah. When the devil comes and try to put a bondage on you, that yoke is going to come off you. And you say, I am free in the name of Jesus. How many are ready to be free from the bondage of Satan? Somebody praise the Lord in here. Amen. So God here, he is sending us free. He is delivering us. He is causing us. That's why you, sometimes you look at a person and says, this person, the labor of their growth in the Lord is different to everybody else. What is happening? Because this person is growing from one degree of glory to another. He's just going higher. Everything that he says, there is Jesus on. When he, this person speaks, there's wisdom. Whatever he touches, it succeeds. His lifestyle is full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he has the anointing of God. Samson, in the Bible, he was a might valor man. He was anointed of God. God was using him like nobody's business. He, he destroyed so many Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. And as he did that, there are a lot of people that ask him, what is happening with Samson? Samson, he says, I'm here to destroy. But one time, Samson allowed the yoke to come. Delilah came. And when Delilah came, he rubbed Samson and he got the anointing out of Samson. He started rubbing where the anointing was until the yoke could fit in. I want to let you know, you know, the Bible speaks, be careful of, there are three things, pride, gold, and what? And women. Amen. And Samson, his problem was, Delilah came, he realized, he says, uh, the yoke is slippery. This man has been anointed. He has killed the Philistines. Not even a single lion could be there. Then the devil was devising, trying to find a method how to destroy Samson. What does the devil do? He came and started rubbing him until now the yoke 
could hold on. Then he said, tell me where your power is. And Samson says, well, you see, I'm in Nazareth. My hair has not been cut. The anointing disappears. They bound him. They arrested him. Pricked his eyes. But while Samson was in bondage, he realized, he said, I am chosen. I am covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been separated from my mother's womb to bring deliverance among of my nation. I am going to seek God if you can anoint me one more time so that the yoke can be out of me. I want to destroy as many as I can. And the Samson, he let the hair grow. And as he was letting the hair growing, the anointing was coming on him. Because that anointing was being poured on his head by God. And as the anointing was being poured on his head by God, God was saying, you are about to shake the Philistines. You are about to destroy them. They are about to know that your God is a mighty God. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your God is greater than anything that any man can do. Today the devil bowed. And he said, let me perform for the Philistines for the last moment and they put me between the two pillars and I'm going to show what it is. And the Samson, when the anointing was on him, listen to me very careful. When the anointing of God is on you, there's nothing that you can fail to do. Why? Because our God makes you to do things that no man can do because God himself is the one doing them. Now God comes over there and he says right at this moment I'm going to destroy the enemy. He stands firm at that moment and he says one more time God give me the mighty strength so that I may destroy all these wicked men that has tormented me and they pushed the walls. The Bible says when Samson died, he destroyed more Philistines than any other human being at that particular moment. You and I, we need the anointing of God. Now the Bible says, is there anyone that is sick? Is there anyone in need of a breakthrough? Is there anyone that is trusting God to use him? Oh, allow God to come. Call the elders of the church, and when the elders of the church comes, they'll pour an anointing on you, and when they pour the anointing on you, you are going to recover. It's not only sickness. What is it that you are desiring for God to do? You are going to see the power of God, and you see what a God, how God is going to be bring people down on your behalf. You will say, God, I pray dangerous prayers. Why? It's because you are in oneness with the word of God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. In James' days, these leaders were looked because of their faith. They believed God. They believed what God was doing was the only thing. In our day, sadly, we have... Elders who are characterized not as much by faith, but they are more political in the church. If you go into some of these denominations, apparently I've sat in some of the denominations, there's more debate than seeking, how are we going to have the move of God? Amen? Amen. You sit in denomination today, sometimes you can sit up to past midnight, there's not a single word that is spoken about the move of God. You know what is spoken there? You know, who should be our president? Who should be presiding over us? And then there's jealous. There is all kinds of bitterness, hate. How can God move? The Bible says, but my spirit will not strive with men. Why is there no reviving generation? Because we spend more time thinking about position rather than thinking about the move of God. Amen. Amen. We spend more time, we are crying for the revival, but everybody is looking for the muscle. I need to be 
the one in charge. There is more competition in these denominations than there is more hunger for God. In denominations, if you, you, they called that, let all the people that in our denomination come. We seek the face of God. We are changing this place. There will be fewer people. But if we say, come, you know, you know, we are going to be praying, we are going to be seeking the God of Israel. Nobody comes. But if there's just things going on, we are going to be eating, we are going to be debating, we are going to be choosing the president, everybody goes there. We have twisted the whole thing. I believe God, what he's calling us right now, he's calling us to say, put politics aside, lay prostrate before God, Open our hearts to God. Let it be like in the book of Acts, whereby they walked, they moved from house to house, seeking the face of God, cried out, and they were never tired. They shared everything in common. They arrested the powers of the enemy, and the devil was bound. Amen. Can we bind the devil in this generation? It's hard to bind the devil because everyone has an agenda. Instead, our agenda should be one. This is what James was saying. Our agenda should be one. Let's pray. Let's seek the face of God. Chronicles said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and turn away from their evil, I'll come down and heal their land. Why is he healing the land? Because he's setting us free. Why is he setting us free? Because he wants the move of God. So God is... He's encouraging us here to come to the labor where we are going to seek him like there is no tomorrow. Elders are administering the anointing rather than just anyone. So, when we are part of the body, God assigns those that are elders. They release you. They pray for you. When you go out there, you're not going by yourself. You're going there as a person that have been endured and they, there's an accompanist of the move of God. So when there's that anointing, something happens. Because if we pray for you, we release you as, and we say, you go and do wonders, you, the whole home city church is there. If we are two of us in home city church who have prayed, that means you have gone with us and you have gone with the Home City Church and everyone who believes in Home City Church and the God of Home City Church. Amen? That's why it's important to be part of the body of believers. Isolation is dangerous. When God brought the assembly, the first assembly, the first church was in the book of Acts. Why was it in the book of Acts? Because they knew that now power and the strength is about to come. Because when the majority speak as one voice, the demons tremble. Amen. So God is calling us to make the devils tremble. Prayer accompanies the anointing. Bold things happen. Miracles manifest. The anointing of the Lord is part of the breakthrough that each and every believer should receive. The anointing of God is something that you and I, when you come to the house of God, we should cry. If, when you rise up in the morning, just simply say, God, please anoint me today for victory. Anoint me for battle. Anoint me for breakthrough. Anoint me to take over. Anoint me for taking over the land. Anoint me. There are people that are in this church that God has anointed you from your mother's womb, but you have never found your assignment because you do not understand teamwork. Amen. God anointed you from your mother's womb, but the God will never change it. If God anointed you, he's not going to give me your anointing. That anointing is yours, but that anointing must be in the teamwork. The very moment, the revival that we are crying for, maybe you might be the missing link. And as you stand fame and they say, I'm standing on my position, I'm standing on my righteousness, and I'm going to do my wonders, you're going to see what God is going to do. God has anointed you for victory. Don't undermine yourself. Don't look down on yourself. Don't get discouraged. Don't think little of yourself. Look at yourself. I'm an explosion. 
I have dynamite on me. The devil cannot stand me. I am chosen by the word of God. And I, I was born to do might wonders for the kingdom of God. God separated you for greatness. And you have that greatness inside you. You have that victory inside you. You have that power. They call it dunamis. You have that power that when you do something, things they happen. You have been just been chosen for, before you were born in your mother's womb. God prepared you in the heaven for this generation, for this time. I wish men and women, they can rise up in their spirit and they say, Preacher, I am that man, that woman that is going to change Buffalo for Jesus. Oh my God, I'm that man, that valiant, that warrior. I am that chosen. I, God, I feel the gloriousness of God all over me. God chose me before I was born. My mouth is full of ammunition. Devil, be careful because I am that dangerous that God warned you that there is a man or woman that I have chosen to do wonders. And it's you. Rise and shine for the glory of God has come upon you. This is your time to take over the land. Stand up and shine for the glory of God. Let the devil bow in the name of Jesus because greater is he that is in you than the one that is in the world. God separated you for victory. Victory is upon your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is your time. This is your day. This is your hour. I commission you as the elder of Home City Church to take over the land. Every place where you step, you shall possess it. Buffalo will never be the same again as long as you take the rightful possession. You are the child of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Take your rightful position. Take your rightful place. Stand and be counted. Stand in that position. Be victorious. Be victorious. Tell the enemy, time is now. I'm victorious for victory. I was born, I was made. I, I always tell people, I said, I was born to minister the word of God. And I, when I stand on the pulpit, I feel complete. Hallelujah. When I stand on the pulpit, I just feel complete. Something inside me rises. When I'm outside of the, outside of the pulpit, I feel lost. Because that's not my place. But when I stand on the pulpit, I just feel everything within me starts just coming, rising. And I feel God today is telling me, as the elder, under the chief elder, Jesus Christ, and other elders that are in this church, today I'm commissioning you to have the spasm of the Holy Ghost in your bodies, to take your rightful place, to literally move in a mighty way, wherever you shall be. May the world know and honor you that there's a Jenna in the kingdom of God. God is about to do something. This is the day that I want to commission you. And please take this commission as from the Lord. Don't take it. I'm just the recipient of what God wants to do. Because there are some people here that some of you have two, some of you have five, some of you have ten. And God is distributing it. But whatever God has given you, two is not little, ten is not much, but it's how you use it. Amen. Sometimes we look, some will have one, but one is not little, fifty is not much. It's how you use what God has released to you. Several times we look and say, oh, I don't have much. The much that you have, that you have received, rise and take it and stand firm. 
and they make a declaration and tell the world, I am a new cre creation chosen by God for victory. Hallelujah. 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 I sense the anointing of God in here. I really sense the anointing of God. Thank you, Brother Tom, for that word that you, you gave because that was a confirmation of what God had revealed to me. And Sister Bethan, thank you even for that song when you said, let's come over here. But I strongly believe today as we surrender our lives before God, God is going to do things that no one can comprehend. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. How many are ready for the commissioning this day? If you're ready wherever you are, I don't need you to stand. Just stand up. Let God take over your life. This is the hour that you'll never be the same. Hallelujah. Like I say, one is not little. Ten is not much. It's how you use what God has given you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing that song that you sing. This is your day of breakthrough. 
This is your day of victory. When you lay hands on the sick, the sick will receive. Everything that you are believing God, this is the day. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release an anointing of God of mission impossible to be possible in Jesus' name. I release the glory of God. doing in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 